So, about a few yeah, times, I guess, but you can go through it if you want. Just run through it again. No, no. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, ask these guys. Okay. Uh, but just you know, get it, get it on your film so we have that. Okay. One second. You got this yes. brief summary. We want to represent things as four vectors. We can't use <coughs> times of these proper time. And the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So four vectors are things that transform the same way as the coordinates by a linear homogeneous transformation, or its transformation. And we, we want space-time to be a vector space so we can do vector calculus with it. And so we demand that the four velocity be a four vector, which it's not if you take the x alpha dt, but it is if you use tau as the parameter for the path. All right, then we construct the momentum multiplying by something we don't know what, m, and it reduces to the mass m in the Newtonian limit. But what we find is that in order for four momentum to be a four vector, that m has to be constant too. So there's only one mass, it's the m we multiply the four velocity by in order to get the momentum. Now, the momentum... So what if I talk about rest mass? <clears throat> no such thing. Okay. There, is not, just, there is just the mass. There's not a rest mass thing? No, it's, it's, there's it's, no it's, such I mean, thing as rest mass. mass, there's mass no such thing as relativistic mass. mass. Those are um, I was just errors of the early days of relativity. So what about how much changes in particle physics when we probe it, it does particles? not. Okay, so here's, here's the proof I just gave. Uh, we, we showed that if we define u to be the time rate of change with respect to proper time, then in a, to a different inertial observer, it's going to be transformed by Lorentz transformation. So, so this definition of the tangent vector to a world line of some particle moving off there is transforms as a four vector. Then to find the four momentum, we multiply by m. But in, we, we want p to be a four vector two, and so it must have this transformation law as well. Yeah. The and Lorentz transformation. If we put in m tilde u tilde alpha, all right, then over here we put in m u alpha. We already showed that u is a proper four vector, so those are equal, which tells us that m tilde equals m. There is only oh. m is a scalar. Oh, now the thing that so it doesn't transform the way... It, it does not transform, transform. with velocity. Yeah. It's independent of velocity. <clears throat> now, the thing that does depend on velocity is the energy, of course. There's kinetic energy. Oh, I see. So, so P alpha is energy over the speed of light and the three momentum. <clears throat> and we just showed that it can be written as this constant <clears throat> M times gamma times C comma, three vector v. And so we can identify the three momentum as m gamma v, and the energy as m c squared gamma. So, you know, here's another shocker for you. E is not equal to mc squared. <laughs> <laughs> mc squared that's, gamma. That's the rest of it, mc squared gamma. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Okay. So these, these are the relativistic energy and momentum, and uh, there's going to be a confusion here. So, um, if I ever want to talk about the Newtonian three momentum, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the Newtonian three momentum. I'll, I'll, from now on, I'll put a subscript on the Newtonian one because it's changed. This is not momentum anymore. This is momentum. There's a gamma in it. Hmm. Right? Now, at lowest order, we can... Uh, we can write gamma, that's 1 minus v squared over c squared to the minus 1 half, which if I expand in a Taylor series is 1 plus a half uh, v magnitude squared over c squared, uh, plus higher order terms, which if the velocity is low, we can neglect. So the uh, relativistic three momentum um, is approximately equal to m times v 
times 1 plus a half b squared over c squared, <clears throat> well, which is, you know, to, to the lowest order in v's and v's over c's, that's just mv. So at low velocity, the relativistic momentum is approximately equal to the Newtonian three momentum. For energy, it's a little different because, um, well, E, <coughs> e has this big C squared in it, um, C squared gamma, where we're approximating gamma as one plus a half V squared over C squared. Um, so <coughs> this is approximate now. Uh, which is some big constant, mc squared, plus one-half. Here the c squared cancels, so this correction term matters, and we get a half mv squared. And that's equal to just mc squared plus the, the usual Newtonian kinetic energy. So energy just includes, it, it includes the rest energy or the mass energy, um, and it includes the kinetic energy and higher order correction. So what is the difference between that mass energy and the energy in the kinetic term? Do you need to, so what is the difference between the mass ah. in the mc squared and the mass in the half mv squared? Oh, no, they're, they are this invariant mass. Okay. That, that's, that's a constant everywhere. So when we say E equals mc squared, yeah. m is a constant, c is a constant. Yeah. So when E changes, what change? Uh, the velocity. You pick up kinetic <coughs> energy. Right. So, so E, e has the, you know, this gamma depends on V. So energy depends on velocity. Well, we knew that. Right? Momentum depends on velocity. We knew that. And the thing we didn't know in all of this was that there's this additional constant associated with the energy. <coughs> that even at zero velocity, that mass has uh, some inherent energy. So is, is gamma 1 over the square root of that yeah, thing? Yeah, to minus 1 half. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. yeah. So you just do some binomial approximation then for the E at the lowest. It's, yeah, just a Taylor series for that. Oh, so how do we compute rest energy? Or rest energy, yeah, for different particles? Move in the rest, look in the rest frame of the particle. <clears throat> Like right. move with the particle. What's that? Move with the particle. Yeah, move with the particle, then it's at rest in your okay. frame. And the energy you measure for it is just that mc squared. Then how do they <clears throat> extract this energy for nuclear bombs and things like that? Oh. <laughs> okay. Bombless. Yes. Um, okay. The, um, okay, because I know that was the big thing about E. So it's, it's, it's on Google. You can look it up. You know, ocean and all that. <laughs> the, the mass of uh, a thing we might call a particle, so let's say a proton. Okay. All right. The mass of a proton isn't just the sum of the masses of three quarks and massless gluons, there's a whole lot of energy in there. Oh. But it's a stable bound system where that average energy, um, you know, mc squared for the quarks plus a whole lot of kinetic energy um, is <clears throat> extremely constant, hmm. right? And so we can talk about the mass of a proton, but if we, uh, let's see, uh, <clears throat> what could we do? If we took two protons, they have a certain, what, twice that mass, and there's, let's take a proton and an antiproton and mm -hmm. collide them and so they come off with three mesons. Mm -hmm. Well, we freed those mesons from the binding energy of the proton. Mm -hmm. There's still some binding energy in the mesons, quark, antiquark, pair. Mm -hmm. But those mesons now, the sum of their masses is uh, going to be somewhat, it's going to be something less than the, uh, the energy with all the binding energy. Let's see, did I say it right? Um, <clears throat> is it more or less good? Uh, let's see. Well, if we could put them back together and make the protons, let's see, this is the best example. Um, so they take part of this table energy out. So, yeah. So yeah. Th that's yeah, whichever that way the reaction table. naturally goes. So that energy that was table with the proton and the anti proton. Yeah. So, you know, what, uh, one of those is going to have different mass than mm -hmm. the other, mm -hmm. and the difference will be made up in kinetic energy. Oh. Right. So, so when, say, uh, 
a uranium atom, mm -hmm. which is a stable enough energy content, counting the binding energy and the mass energy, uh, that it has a definite mass. Splits into like krypton and whatever el other element it splits into, barium or something, I forget. Um, the mass of those two final particles together, atoms, is less than the mass of the uranium. The difference is made up in the kinetic energy of a few neutrons and the krypton and, the, you know, the atoms. So you have this overall energy balance, but yeah, you have to count binding energy. This is a big difference, by the way, between um, uh, you know, this is field theory, we should talk about particles, um, between atom atomic energy levels and uh, uh, um, baryon energy levels. Okay, the, the binding energy of quarks in a proton or a neutron, uh, they're, they're very high energies, right? If you, if you bring together, uh, well, yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, if you could separate the quarks and bring them together, you'd get a whole lot of energy off. There's a lot of binding energy there. Uh, but those quarks are in some kind of uh, ground state orbits around each other, exchanging gluons, and it's a complicated thing going on in there. An atom, when an electron changes energy level, okay, you know, the, uh, you excite an electron in hydrogen, you know, it's, it's a few electron volts. You can get it clear off with 13 electron volts, but the mass of that hydrogen atom is close to the mass of a uh, of a proton. It's almost a thousand uh, GE, uh, it's almost, uh, sorry, a GeV, you know, a billion electron volts, and you're, you know, changing energy level of that electron. A few electron volts, you, you'd have to measure very, very well to see it, the mass. The mass is different. An excited hydrogen atom has more energy, and so it would be more massive, but by, you know, one part in a billion. A proton, has many excited states, actually. Uh, those quark orbitals can, can be excited into higher quark orbitals, but the amount of energy involved to raise the energy of a quark is like many GeV. Mm -hmm. So an excited state of a proton, which we've seen, we've seen excited states of most of the, the baryons and mesons, but they look like different particles because they're so much more massive. You know, excited to say the proton, I'll just pick a random number, but, you know, it could be 10 GeV or 100 GeV uh, because it takes that much energy to excite the quarks inside that bound proton. Okay. So you're talking about particle excited states, not the nuclear excited yes. states. Yes, okay. and nuclear in between, yeah, right? I, I mean, yeah, uh, a, a nuclear fusion of, you know, deuterons, you know, yeah. gives off like, you know, was it 10, uh, 2... Something M. So two two GeV. Uh, no, MeV. It's MeV. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe tens of, of yeah. MeV you can get yeah. out of those kinds of interactions. Mm -hmm. So we're going up from tens of EV to tens of millions to you know tens of billions of EV as we go to these smaller and smaller mm -hmm. particles. Excuse me. Can I just ask? So all these yeah. particles, like mesons, those are excited states of Two quarks, is that right? Bound states of two quarks. Right, right. Bound yeah, and, and they can be excited states, yes. And then you get other yeah, quarks. A, it's a quark anti quark pair. So you you have to have um, you have to have zero color number. Uh, zero color. Um, quarks each come in three colors, call them red, green, and black or something, right? Anything you like. But the um, you either have to have all three so it's color neutral. Or you have to have a color anti-color. So green anti-green has no net color. And those are the only particles we see, right? At high enough energy, you might see, you know, some kind of colored uh, uh, particles. But um, that takes an awful lot of energy. But all the particles with lower mass than the proton, besides the electron, <clears throat> yeah. they're all, these baryons and mesons, they're all excited states of a quark anti quark pair. Uh, the, yeah, the mesons. The mesons are, yeah, any, anything lighter than a proton 
the proton is really the, the most stable baryon. Oh, three. Yeah, with three quarks of different colors. Um, uh, less mass than that, you look at the pions or the, the um, well, yeah, the, the pions are the common ones. Um, I forget what the K mass is, <clears throat> whether that's more or less than a proton. Uh, and of course, you have higher energy uh, quark anti quark states. But <clears throat> they were thought to be different particles, right? But now. Yeah, uh, you know, since the since the standard model has characterized the regularities, uh, we see that really all the particles we see are uh, excited states of either quark anti quark pairs, or bound states of quark anti quark pairs, or three different quarks, and their excited states. Excuse me, one more question, please. Uh, sure, sure, sure. We, what about we can run the whole course on questions. <laughs> it's great. You know, this what is, about this is good. massless particles? Now, this could ah. just did. It right. only be a straight line. You can't have like curves of photons through space time. Right? They're all straight lines. All right. So let's go back to our observer here, and let's look at a photon. So photons travel at forty-five degrees. So uh, that curve has a tangent vector, all right? The problem is, I mean, you know, there's a definite direction here. But the thing is, there's, there's no natural parameter for it because the proper time interval is zero for, for a photon. It's, <coughs> it's, uh, its tangent is a null vector. Uh, but it does have a momentum four vector. Um, and let's see. Yeah, we tend to call it K. Um, and it, that's going to be uh, a frequency and a weight number, or you know, and as as a as a momentum, we might write something like this. So <clears throat> it has energy, it has momentum, but. Uh, P alpha, P alpha, the invariant length of this is h bar squared uh, omega squared over c squared minus k squared. Um, but omega is the square root of k squared c squared for a photon. So this is zero. So the invariant length of the momentum vector, the momentum vector exists, but it has length zero. So there's no proper time, there's no four velocity. For a photon, yeah, weird math. Okay, uh, I, I should have done this for our uh, our regular particle momentum, where we do have a, a time-like vector, because p alpha p alpha has to be something invariant, <coughs> right? Well, what is it, right? Well, we're going to get an m squared u alpha u alpha. And did I work out u alpha squared last time? Do you know what it is? Remember, u alpha is gamma. C V. I can write it in terms of a metric. It's an invariant alpha u alpha. We're going to have gamma squared. Yeah, it's c squared minus v squared, which is c squared um, one minus v squared over c squared. Over right, gamma squared is one minus v squared over c squared. It's c squared. So the length of the four velocity is c. Always constant. Every observer. That had to be invariant. That had to be some invariant. We only have one natural candidate for that. So for the four momentum, we get m squared c squared as the invariant length of that vector. This shows again that this m needs to be a constant hmm. because this is a, an invariant scalar. That does not change with the Lorentz transformation. Uh, the down indices, you guys said you're, you're familiar with that. You lower with the metric. Our metric here is Minkowski. How long, back on the energy thing, yeah. there's like an e squared equals m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. How do you get that formula? Uh, it's right here. Oh, well, that gives All right. Me. So, all right. When, when I lower an index on any four vector, uh, so, all right, suppose we've got p alpha. And I write 
eta on that to give what I call the beta. Right? That's going to be, uh, sorry, um, we have m and we have gamma and the four velocity, but we put minus signs on the spatial parts so it's c and minus b. So then when I write this implicit sum, Hi, sister. <laughs> um, okay, uh, when I'm writing this uh, implicit sum, p alpha, p alpha, um, I have this, essentially the dot product with the up one, which is going to give me an m squared and a gamma squared, but then it's going to give c squared minus v squared, because this one picked up the sign from the metric. Okay, so then, uh, well, and we showed that that's just m squared c squared. But um, also, we can write p alpha is e over c and the relativistic three momentum. And then uh, p alpha down is e over c and minus p. So, if I take the dot product in this form, I get e squared over c squared minus relativistic p squared, but we just showed that's equal to m squared c squared. Now I multiply by c squared and I have e squared, bring the p to the other side, I have p squared c squared plus m squared c to the fourth, and there's your formula. Gotcha. Fancy. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a problem. Uh, just you know, jot this down or just remember. A particle undergoing constant acceleration. Yeah. This is a good exercise in using four vectors. Mm -hmm. Think about it as a four-dimensional vector problem. Right? Write, write invariant four-vector things. And you can integrate it um, just in terms of tau without ever going into you know, some particular frame. So here's the problem. We have um, right, some inertial frame of reference. And we have a particle which undergoes constant acceleration. What I mean by that is uh, in the instantaneous rest frame of the particle, I can write the four acceleration, which is d u alpha d tau, as uh, Ah, I'm not going to say it quite yet, because I want to show you something. Um, U alpha U alpha is, we just showed, C squared. So if I differentiate this, I'm going to get twice D U alpha D tau U alpha. I, I get two factors, and I can, I can raise and lower these this way, um, equals zero. <coughs> But that says that the acceleration four vector and the four velocity are orthogonal in space time. Now, in the instantaneous rest frame, uh, u alpha is just straight up the t axis, the instantaneous t axis, which means that uh, a has zero time component. So, in order for this to be true, I've got to have zero here. And let's, let's just do it two, do it two dimensionally um, so it moves in the x direction. So we can take the velocity v this, where now notice a alpha a alpha is just that constant square minus that constant square. We also have a alpha u alpha is zero. We have u alpha u alpha is <coughs> c squared, we have u alpha equals dx alpha d tau, we have a alpha is du alpha d tau. Solve it using this, uh, you know, make it a two-dimensional problem, okay? So write, write our a alpha as, um, all right, in general, you know, it's some a0, a1, u alpha is some u0, u1, um, you know, x alpha, you know, some 
uh, x0, x1, but they have to satisfy all of these. So solve it this way. Don't try to put it in terms of somebody's velocity v, and you'll find a nice hyperbolic path fairly <coughs> easily. So problem for next time. Oh, would you like to see a slick derivation of the uh, Lorentz transformation? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so. So one thing that we've said is that space-time is a vector space, and so uh, when we move from one frame of reference to another, there has to be a linear transformation between the, uh, the, the four vector positions in two frames of reference. So you know maybe we've got one observer, O, and we've got another observer, O tilde. Uh, their time, time, tilde, um, their spatial axes, x and x tilde, and you know there's there's some relative velocity v between these. Um, one's moving in the x direction with respect to the other. Now, if I'm moving in the x direction, I can I can take two two markers, and I can I can draw parallel lines on on the wall, and the separation of those is going to be the same as the separation of my hands. Mm -hmm. What that's saying is that uh, the vertical direction doesn't change, or if I do it this way, mm -hmm. the perpendicular directions don't change. So uh, for motion in the x direction, we know that y tilde is y and z tilde is z. We can, we can reduce this to a two-dimensional problem. Let's, let's rotate our axes so that um, rotate our axes so that the motion is in the x direction. Mm -hmm. We can we're allowed to do that. We get to choose our coordinates. So now, what we want to do is uh, envision a, uh, a a flash of light. These two observers cross right back here at time zero, and I, I want to. Uh, send out, you know, a flash of light. And that light, of course, moves with the speed c. So, in the x-coordinates, uh, the O observer is going to say x squared plus y squared plus z squared is c squared times their t squared, and the observer in the O tilde frame will say the same. Like this. Well, I can I can bring the CT to the other side, and that has to be zero, and that's the that's the null vector position of that uh, one of those photons or something. Now, in order for these to undergo a linear transformation and vanish at the same time, that means these have to be proportional. So uh, we can write um, x squared. Uh, minus c squared t squared is proportional to x tilde squared minus c squared t tilde squared. And now, it turns out, uh, despite arguments I've seen in the literature to the contrary, this, this lambda uh, actually can be a, a function of the velocity. You can have a conformal transformation here. Um, <coughs> It would have to be integrable so you wouldn't detect uh, a change in like clock rates or something between two frames. Um, but you know, something like uh, e to a function of the velocity, um, where f at minus v is it's an anti-symmetric function. So f of minus v is minus f of v, uh, then if you try to boost back, you get the opposite factor and it just cancels. 
So you could have a factor like that. Um, I think maybe Jackson argues that you can't. Um, what he's trying to do is quickly derive the Lorentz transformation. He didn't really have a good argument for making that zero. Um, uh, <coughs> it's trickier to make this depend on the coordinates because if it depends on coordinates, you're in a curved space, which hey. relativity is not. Uh, uh, special relativity, general relativity allows that. You could, you could have local scale transformations that wouldn't show up in experiments since we always compare ratios of lengths. Right? Let's not go there today. But um, what I want to do is, a la Jackson, we're going to take lambda equal 1. Uh, we're, we're not going to do a transformation in that form. So, so now we just say that this quantity uh, has to be preserved. Well, you'll recognize that as, uh, let's see, minus c squared tau squared um, as, as the principal invariant. Now, the, the cute trick I just hit on while I was writing this, I'm sure I'm not the first to think of doing it this way, um, that was your problem there, uh, is to introduce new coordinates. Let's let u be defined as uh, uh, x plus ct, and v be defined as x minus ct. <coughs> so now, what we have is uv has to be u tilde, u tilde, v tilde. Well, we also know there has to be a, a linear transformation. So u tilde is a u plus b v, and v tilde has to be c u plus d v. And if we if we just multiply this out. Uh, let's see what, what we get. Uh, u tilde times v tilde is going to be ac u squared plus ad plus bc quantity times uv uh, plus bd times v squared. And uh, we have to have ac equals zero and we have to have bd equals zero. But we can't, we can't have, um, this has got to be non-zero. This has got to be one. So uh, we can't have uh, A and C or B and D both be zero. Um, one of those has to be non-zero. Basically, what we need is uh, B equals C equals zero and uh, A equals D, uh, A equals one over D. Let me write the other, d as 1 over a. Or we need the other, a equals d equals 0, and um, then c equals 1 over b. And, oops, there goes your problem. Now we introduce a convenient parameterization. Let's let, uh, uh, let's let a equal e to the psi. And uh, then that, let's 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 just work on the first one. The second one is just a I think it's a boost the other direction. I think I gave that as a problem too, so you get to try it. Then d is one over that e to the minus psi. Very simple transformation. That's your Lorentz transformation. But now we we go back. So this says that u right. Remember u is uh, u tilde is a u plus b v, b is zero, so we have e to the psi u. And v tilde is e to the minus psi v. Very simple Lorentz transformation. Funky, right? Yeah. Well, now substitute back, right? x uh, u is x tilde plus c t tilde has to be e to the psi x plus ct, um, x tilde minus ct tilde has to be e to the minus psi, x minus ct. And so, um, if we add these and divide by 2, I see that x tilde has to be, um, I, I'm going to, on the x here, I'm going to have half the sum of these, which is x cosh psi. 
And when I add these, I have CT times half the difference of these, which is CT times cinch psi. And similarly, T tilde, I get by, uh, or let's just go for CT tilde. Um, now I subtract these, and it's the X that gets the cinch psi, and then uh, subtracting this is this is the CT that gets the cosh. How many of you see, have seen that formulation of Lorentz transformation? Okay, okay, so that you know you know that if you now take tanch psi equal v over c, it gives the usual familiar form of the Lorentz transformation. So now, is this is this yeah. what they mean when they say Lorentz transformation has nothing to do with length? Uh, uh, Contraction or time dilation. It's oh, just, absolutely. Yeah, it's just that, that stuff thing. is. Uh, I mean, it's fun to play with in uh, your first year of college, you know, okay. in intro physics. But no, work in proper times, okay. work in proper quantities for vectors. You yeah. know, always try to think in those terms. You can get so confused with space-time yeah. diagrams and gamma factors and time dilation, length, and you know, t and x are just coordinates, right? So you know, the thing you want to compare is pick a frame, find the coordinates in that frame of all of the relevant points in your pole in the barn experiment, calculate the proper lengths as seen in that frame, and you'll know what happens. Yeah. Right? So do it all in terms of proper quantities. Put all your variables into one frame of reference. It doesn't matter which. Choose it so that things are simple. And once you have the coordinates of every relevant point, you easily compute Know, proper intervals, proper lengths, and so on. Okay, so um, uh, my notes have uh, the last stages of this, turning it into the usual form. And um, as I said before, I, I give some exercises in the notes that you know, do the exercises. You know, unless there's something you know really tedious that you've done seven times before, uh, you don't need to do that. You know how to raise and lower indices with a metric, how to take Einstein convention inner products, so I don't have to talk about that. Um, you know how to characterize Lorentz transformations other than the invariance of this. Let me remind you. If you, if you would like to do uh, a formal development of the whole Lorentz then you take a little bit different starting point. Uh, you get yourself over into group theory. Right. So we have, and almost all symmetry transformations are uh, groups, continuous ones like Lorentz transformations are Lie groups. Uh, so, uh, so is a Lorentz transform a Lie group? Yeah. Oh. Two boosts is, is some third boost, right? It closes. Um, you know, what do we need to check? Uh, the identity is no boost. Mm -hmm. The inverse is boost by minus V. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can write them as matrices, so they're associative. Yeah. So, yes, Lorentz transformations form a Lie group. Now, uh, the thing that we're preserving is vector length. So, <clears throat> we, can, we can write that... The metric written this way, right? The the proper length of uh, for vector x <coughs> has to be preserved, and then we expand this side. This side is equal to eta alpha beta lambda alpha mu x mu lambda beta nu x nu. I'm going to change the index on this side to mu nu x mu x nu. <coughs> so now both sides are contracted with x mu x nu. Now, don't miss that multiplying by the same vector twice, contracting twice, is a symmetric contraction. So what that says is the symmetric part of this side, uh, what is it, eta, alpha, beta, lambda, alpha, mu, lambda, beta, nu, the symmetric part on mu, nu has to equal eta, mu, nu. But both sides are symmetric, so you, you can just drop the x's here. This is the de definition of Lorentz transformation. Uh, I can write this in matrix notation as uh, 
uh, lambda transpose eta lambda equals eta. I can infinitesimally expand this and find generators for the Lorentz group, and you know we're off and running doing doing group theory, finding explicit representations for uh, for the Lorentz group. We don't need to do that. Uh, we'll we'll do enough with the groups later. Okay, so then we have proper time. We found those forms. So yeah, most of this is summarized in my notes. Um, <clears throat> let me talk a bit about Lorentz invariant tensors. There's one. Hey. Right. I so the metrics and all. So yeah, that is the metric, right? <laughs> um, so so the metric is a Lorentz invariant tensor. Uh, you do a Lorentz transformation. This is how you do a Lorentz transformation of a rank two object. So this is exactly what you would do, and oh, it gives the same thing back. That's a rare property. Mm -hmm. There's actually only one other thing that has that property. The second fundamental form. The second, it's a tensor. The, the it's, it's an extrinsic curvature tensor? Nope, nope. Uh, Ricci tensor. You're just guessing. Yeah, no. <laughs> those are all the things you can build out of the metric. You can, well, yeah, you can build them out of the metrics the with derivatives, right? Yeah. I mean, yes, uh, yes. In fact, here, the you're right, they are invariant here, but they're all zero. The identity <laughs> matrix. This is, this is Minkowski space. The identity <laughs> matrix, that's true. Right, delta, alpha, delta. I got one. I knew uh, if I kept saying things. Is like <laughs> <laughs> lambda, <laughs> alpha, mu, delta, mu, nu, lambda, bar, nu, beta. A down index gets the inverse transformation. Right, but that's just a Kronecker delta, so I'm multiplying lambda alpha nu with its inverse, and that is the Kronecker delta. So, yes, the Kronecker delta is Lorentz invariant. <clears throat> There's one more. One more. Antisymmetric. <clears throat> yes, the Levy cheated it, tensor. <clears throat> Epsilon alpha beta mu nu, which I reckon you guys know. Zero, one, two, three is plus one, and Epsilon alpha beta mu nu is totally anti-symmetric. Like that. So <coughs> it has what? Uh, in principle, four to the fourth components, but really only 24 are uh, non-zero, and they're all plus or minus one. So uh, one, two, three, zero would be negative one. Yeah, yeah. So interchange any two indices, so epsilon. You know, zero, two, one, three is minus one. You can get you can get to every combination that way. If any two are the same, right? We have epsilon alpha beta mu nu is minus epsilon beta alpha mu nu. So if alpha and beta both happen to be two, three zero, it's minus epsilon two two three zero. Well, it's minus itself, so it's got to be zero. Yeah. So any repeated index in the thing's history. Excuse me. Yes, what question. Is, what did you say? These are only, the only three that there's no more that are very. Quite there are, yeah. Uh, other than the identity matrix, there are only two Lorentz invariant tensors the Levy Chivita tensor and the Minkowski metric. Mm. Right? I mean, uh, there, are lots, there are lots of covariant tensors. No. That transform linearly and homogeneously into like eta tilde, right? But invariant. But invariant. Mm -hmm. What about higher dimensions? What if you're in five dimensions? Then the it's a property of the symmetry group. So the Lorentz group, even in twenty-eight dimensions, has these two invariants. Now, other groups have more invariants. Um, let's see. Well. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm confounding in my mind two things. I'm, I'm thinking of Casimir operators. Oh. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, we don't need to go ahead. Well, I mean, they're important. This is how we know what a particle is. Right? Um, Wigner said that a particle is a representation of the Poincaré group. It's, it's, it's an object on which the Poincaré group acts linearly and homogeneously. And all such objects can be characterized by 
um, to Casimir operators. Um, Casimir operators are uh, operators that commute with with the whole group. Um, now these are operators, not not just tensor objects, so it's a little different thing. But the two for the Poincaré group are mass and spin. And that's the reason that we characterize particles by their mass and by their spin, because those are two invariants of the Poincaré group. And the Poincaré group is what uh, is the symmetry of the space-time in which all these particles occur. So uh, any other choice of objects to characterize particles would lead us astray. We wouldn't be invariantly characterizing. We use Casimir operators. This is a black hole of particle. Whew. Let's see. Got mass and spin. Right? Yeah. Is that for this semester? Yeah, but they evaporate. Are we supposed to discuss that this semester at all? I'm just black kidding. Hole. That should be like um, next two years, quantum field theory four. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, at the rate we're going, that's what it's going to be, right? Just. Um, but let's let's see. So yeah, in, in my notes I go through uh, the proof that this is invariant. I'm going to sketch it here, just just Ooh, briefly. Maybe not because it has entropy. Do particles have entropy? A collection of particles do. Yeah, then, uh, <laughs> yeah because a black hole has entropy, and that's the first thing that I can think of. It. It's yeah. entropy depends on its entropy. Entropy is a property of an ensemble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. You've got to do coarse graining. The same as temperature. Yeah. A particle has no temperature. Yeah. The system yeah, has That's the same, main yeah. thing, so I don't think so, a black hole could be a particle because it has a this, this is all very good reasoning. Yeah. yeah. A black hole is a system. That was a good a collection of particles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just agree for that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Particles don't evaporate. Um, I guess I don't think I don't think yeah. Yeah. Uh, If I have a matrix M, uh, let's make it a uh, let's let's make it contravariant. Um, I can I can write its determinant by uh, basically anti-symmetrizing uh, its distinct components. So m zero m beta one m uh, u two m u three. This anti-symmetrization does the thing you do when you take a determinant. And I can write this as, uh, you know, if I if I were to leave those indices free, let's let's consider what epsilon alpha beta mu nu m alpha rho m beta sigma m mu lambda m running out of Greek letters here psi. There's 24. Yeah, so we're fine so far. We only needed eight. All right. I'm anti-symmetrizing this, but it's all M's here, so this has to be anti-symmetric on rho, sigma, lambda, and psi. But the only rank four anti-symmetric thing in four dimensions has to be proportional to epsilon. So this has to be something times epsilon, rho, sigma, lambda, psi. Um, now, <coughs> in fact, let's see, if we do the counting right, uh, I can write the determinant of, of M as epsilon alpha beta mu nu, and then epsilon, um, what did I use here, rho sigma lambda psi with M alpha rho through M nu psi. And uh, let's see, actually, um, I'm overcounting here because I'm contracting these two epsilons, and that's going to give me a factor of minus four factorial. So I'm going to multiply it by minus one over four factorial, and that's another way to write the determinant. <coughs> now, uh, I can raise these and lower those, so I can also write one over four factorial epsilon alpha beta mu nu epsilon rho sigma lambda psi m alpha up rho down through m nu up psi down. And so this means that I can take the, um, I can use this to uh, write the determinant, let's see, what, what happens here? 
So should that top determinant have another levy chivita tensor on it? No, because I specified zero, one, two, three. Yeah. This one? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, so if, um, yeah, let's see. I think what one I want to modify is this. Um, let's see. This is actually uh, the determinant of M because, let's see, if I put another epsilon in here and put an epsilon on there, I'm going to get uh, minus 4 factorial times the determinant here, and I'm going to get minus 4 factorial times the determinant there. So that coefficient is actually the M. Now, let's, let's look at this for a Lorentz transformation. We have epsilon alpha, beta, mu, nu. And let's, let's write these with the indices down. So I have lambda alpha rho, lambda beta, sigma, lambda mu, tau, lambda nu, psi. That has to be the determinant of lambda times epsilon rho, sigma, tau, psi. But for a proper orthochronous Lorentz transformation, that's one that doesn't change the direction of time and one that doesn't uh, do a parity inversion of the coordinates. So you keep a right-handed coordinate system and you preserve the direction of time. Proper um, means no parity. Orthochronous means you preserve time. A proper orthochronous Lorentz transformation has determinant one. And that's the Lorentz transformation law for the levy chivita tensor. It's invariant. Cool, huh? Credit where credit is due. I, I learned a lot of these tricks from Weinberg's book. <coughs> Wein, Weinberg really works out everything, and he does <coughs> almost everything, single thing, yeah, correct. He's okay. Yeah, he is. Okay, so, and that's, that's in here. Um, Oh, some useful identities, let's see. I'll, I'll let you read about those. Then we have discrete Lorentz transformations I just mentioned. The uh, a parity transformation. Parity. Parity takes x and t into minus x and t. It, it inverts the spatial coordinates. Um, time reversal, uh, time reversal is a little tricky. Uh, in a Newtonian sense, it would just reverse time. But you know what you what you really want to be doing is reversing any motion. You're um, uh, you're, you're running proper time backwards. And when we get to field theory, uh, you know I'll spend way too much time trying to sort out the chronicity section for the time transformation. Um, okay, here's energy. So we're moving along nicely here. Okay, Nether's theorem. You guys know Nether's theorem? <laughs> yeah, we just did it in classical. Um, and it's uh, it's pretty much the same here. The difference is that we're dealing with a, uh, a functional. Uh, the Lagrangian is, uh, properly speaking, a, a functional because it's the integral of the Lagrange density. So when we're dealing with a field theory, let's see. Where's Davis today? Yeah, I saw him earlier because I came early, but I had a meeting with the chairman. So that was why I came yeah. late. I saw him when I was going there. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Maybe he forgot or something. Um, okay, so uh, a field action is an integral over all of space time or over some region of space time of a Lagrange density that's uh, functional of fields and uh, their time derivatives. Uh, we're not generally interested in dissipative systems. Uh, 
So we don't really expect to see much uh, explicit time dependence in, mm. inside the Lagrange density. But <clears throat> if we follow the steps to produce the uh, uh, Nether theorem, uh, we do a general variation of the action. So we're going to have uh, variation with respect to phi dot, and I, I should say, you know, phi, this A index, uh, this, this could be any kinds of fields, scalar fields, it could be vector fields, it could be, you know, some tensor fields, uh, you know, what, whatever kind of fields you have, uh, you should have stuck spinner fields in here, um, <coughs> any sorts of fields you have. And so you perform a general variation, del phi uh, dot, sum it over all the fields, and then we have variation with respect to phi, all the phi's times the variation of the phi's. Then uh, we, um, we integrate this time derivative by parts, so we have d4 x ddt of del l del phi dot a del phi a minus the term we didn't have here is d dt of del l del phi dot a and then plus this so I'll put another minus sign del l and you recognize this as being a field version of the Euler Lagrange equation. <clears throat> so that's a general variation, and we've uh, integrated by parts to explicitly show the, uh, the field equation. Is it common for there to be any, like, V double dot A in your Lagrangian density? Here, it's uncommon. Yeah. It's not handled any differently. You have yeah. to integrate twice by parts. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the goal in integrating by parts is to free up a del phi on yeah. everything gotcha. and be able to throw out the rest of the terms. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, in, your, in the not-so-classical physics book, you'll see yeah. that I've done that, okay. that case. All right. Uh, to, to all orders, right? In any order you like. Yeah. You can write a general sum. Mm -hmm. It's cool. It's just got alternating signs yeah. from all the integrations by parts. Yeah. Okay. So um, <coughs> now uh, let all right. Uh, let, let me say restrict uh, del s to del epsilon of s, where del epsilon is uh, the symmetry variation. Okay, so a symmetry of an action is <clears throat> some particular restricted variation of the fields and coordinates, whatever, such that uh, it leaves the action unchanged. And <clears throat> that, is, that statement is independent of the field equations. So a symmetry variation, even, even if we... Uh, even for this general variation, no constraint on del phi varying, uh, vanishing at the endpoints or anything, no imposition of the field equations, <clears throat> del epsilon of s, by definition, is identically zero for any variation. So what I'm going to do in this general variation, I'm going to restrict to the symmetry variation now. Um, so that's, that's one thing I do, and the second thing I do is impose the field equation. So this zero, this term is zero because that's the field equation, is going to be the integral d4x of ddt of the variation of L with respect to the rates of change in fields times the symmetry variation, del phi a. And from this, 
since this, uh, this region, this uh, four-dimensional volume, can actually be any volume, shrink the volume to a point, and I find this has to vanish at every point. And so we have uh, a conserved quantity. Variation of L with respect to phi A dot del epsilon phi A. So another theorem um, in a nutshell. Uh, there, are, there are different versions of this, slightly different versions. Um, there's, uh, there's, there's kind of a trick that happens here. What, uh, you know, this, this works if the variation of the Lagrange density vanishes. Oh, I think the cows are coming. Um, yeah, uh, let, me, let me just say this, and we'll do, we'll do examples on Wednesday. What's the reason that other term goes away? Is it just because it's the Euler Lagrange? Yeah. Basically. This is the Euler Lagrange. So you just plug in that. So, yeah, so we're going to impose the field equation. Yeah. That's the field equation. That's zero. Okay. Yeah, because normally we integrate this to the surface. Yeah. It's very, very yeah. it's on the boundary. Yeah. That, you know, a three dimensional boundary, but yeah. Yeah. that's fine. And that leaves us with this being zero. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but. Um, by doing a general variation and keeping all the terms around, you find this conserved quantity. So that's the, the brilliant inside of the theorem. Now, uh, you know, this is true if del L is zero, but if the variation of the Lagrange density is actually a um, divergence, then uh, that. Um, that wouldn't affect the field equations. You know, mm -hmm. That would integrate to a surface term, but it would show up here. Mm -hmm. And what that does is allows you uh, uh, to keep this d mu k. So, so this variation is all equal to some um, d mu k mu as well, uh, times, well, times the, <clears throat> times the variation. So it only matters restricted to uh, uh, restricted to the symmetry variation. Um, if del L is a divergence, then you're going to get that extra term showing up here. And your conserved current, J mu, instead of just being, uh, well, let's see. Did I, did I write this? Um, Does the d4x imply that we're in a flat space time? Or just oh, 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 I and we can pick any. Yeah, you, you know what I've done here. Uh, I, I didn't mean a time derivative here. I meant all the derivatives. <clears throat> so this is with respect to all the derivatives of the field. Sorry about that. Uh, they'll deem you. It's a classical coming. What's that? It's a classical from earlier. Give yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I'm still in the other class here. Okay, so then this is right. Uh, a down derivative in the denominator is an up mu, so this is going to be a down mu when we integrate by parts. And then um, <coughs> let's see what what do we have here. Uh, Let's see, is it, is it just, uh, let's see, where's the DMU show up? Um, yeah, here. This was variation of DMU <coughs> phi A. And then here we have uh, a, a, a DMU of all that. Okay, there, and so our field equation, <coughs> Or, sorry, our conserved quantity has a d mu here and is a divergence there. <sighs> sorry about that. Okay, so uh, j, j mu is this thing, is uh, del L del d mu phi a um, times the symmetry variation phi a. <coughs> And because 
All right, we have additionally this term, we might have <coughs> minus uh, KU here. Uh, so we could have an extra term like that. And then D mu of J mu is conserved. So either way, here or, and that should be a D mu too. Got it there. All right. Yeah. Sorry about that. It, it, the cows must be coming home. Yeah. All right. Any questions on this? Okay. I'll do some examples of this uh, conservation of energy, conservation of angular momentum, come out of the uh, translational and rotational symmetries uh, this way. So we'll we'll have a look at those next time.